Hello everyone, it's Silver. This is Against the Storm. So back, well, there was a game released called Banished back in like 2014, I want to say. I probably should have looked that up beforehand, huh? Well, it's too late. I already said it. So yeah, 2014, we'll say. And this was a survival city builder. And this was a very novel concept at the time, the idea being that it wasn't just a city builder where you build as big of a city as possible, but rather it was a sort of village builder where you try and create a settlement that was just able to survive, you know, specialize them into like hyper specific things just to try and get them to live long enough to actually succeed. And I always thought, man, that would be a really good concept to combine with a roguelite because roguelites are often really good with like self-contained a small play adventures, you know what I mean? And having those things combined seemed like it made a lot of sense to me. And that's exactly what Against the Storm actually is. It is a roguelite survival city builder. So the idea here is pretty neat. It's that this world is beset by an enormous reality altering storm and it pretty much never ever stops raining ever which uh, I do like the rain, but even I think that might be a little bit much. And the only real solidarity in this world is this big city that's a volcano in the center of everything, and the only place that sort of stays where it is, stays permanent when the storm sweeps through. And your job is to host a series of successful expeditions out into the storm further and further while trying to keep everyone happy, especially the queen, the person in the central city there who is watching all this happen, and is not the most patient sort, but your settlements are never going to be these big thriving metropoli that do everything, like a bit of everything in one town, because that's just not really conducive to survival in the harsh environments that you're going to be plopped down in. Instead, each settlement is probably going to be specialized to a couple of certain things with just a little smattering of everything else, just enough to survive, and then eventually you will hopefully succeed in a settlement. It will then be sort of solidified and you will move on to the next settlement in line and try and explore outward into the storm, clearing your way out, eventually finding these seals, which you can then activate as sort of a meta progression objective to try and uh, help against this storm. But every certain amount of time, the storm will sweep in, all of your settlements will be destroyed, the entire biome and reality of everything around you will be restructured, and you'll start a new expedition from the beginning. But you're not always starting over from scratch because there's a tremendous number of meta unlocks and stuff in this game so that it feels like you're always getting somewhere because there's always a bunch of new stuff to unlock. I would say this game used its time in early access very, very well because of the sheer amount of variety and unlocks and stuff that the game has to offer means there's a really long, comfortable progression curve with lots of cool stuff to do and find. And of course, now that it's 1.0, I definitely knew I needed to take a look at it, given that this was an idea that I've actually had for a while myself and was super happy to see someone actually doing and doing really well from the looks of it. So when you choose an area on the world map to embark, you will know the biome that you're in, as well as the influence of any nearby artifact things that may uh, determine the difficulty a little bit, make things easier or harder, depending on what's around you. And uh, then you'll be plopped down. You'll choose a simple starting set of stuff like some settlers and some resources just a couple of basic things to get you started and you will have a uh, warehouse when you get plopped down and that's it that'll be your only building aside from the kiln the kiln is well it's a flame and you need this flame if this flame goes out things go very very wrong very quickly so keep it fueled as best as you can the kiln also sends out a sort of safe building proximity that you can uh, use. You can build outside of this depending on the, the sort of building you're making, but there are several buildings that have to be built within this area of influence, especially things like housing. And the first thing you're going to want to do are build some logging camps. You have a lot of different sorts of camps that are all for gathering different kinds of resources, but the logging camps are going to be your main go-to at first because you need wood for pretty much everything else. You also need to constantly be expanding the area that you're in because you'll start out in a small clearing. It's good enough for a couple of camps and some basic housing, but it's not that large and you're quickly going to need more space. And as you look around the outside areas, you'll see a bunch of sort of blacked out clearings in the forest surrounding you. And these are called glades. 
and the only way to reach a glade is to have a logging camp actually chop down the trees leading to it and once you open it up the glade will open up and show you what's in it you won't know what's in it beforehand which can be dangerous but uh, opening up a new glade opens up new areas to build as well as possibly new resources and new events uh, eventually a little farther out you'll start finding these glades with a skull symbol on them and these are dangerous glades these have some really impressive rewards really nice stuff but the tasks that you're going to need to complete to actually get those rewards are a lot more difficult and involved than in these smaller glades and they often have some really negative repercussions if you don't do them in time uh, there are also forbidden glades usually at the edges of the map and these are the same kind of concept hugely potent rewards very very dangerous to uncover and you'll start with a smattering of basic buildings, like I mentioned the camps earlier. You'll have pretty much, you know, basic camps for just about every kind of resource, so that whatever it is you find, you'll be able to exploit at least a little bit. But if you want any more advanced buildings, you have the blueprint system. In the bottom left of the screen, you'll see a little crown symbol, and that'll light up, and you can uh, click that to select a blueprint. And in classic roguelite fashion, you'll be given a selection of usually three at first, although this can be upgraded later, and you gotta choose one, so you don't get fine control over exactly what buildings you have and you got to pick the ones from what you're given that you think would best benefit your current situation. So if you spawned into an area that has a ton of copper ore around it and you can plop some mines down on that to start getting some ore out of the ground, then you might want to find a blueprint for, say, uh, something that lets you smelt those in the copper bars. But, say you're in an area with no copper at all, then that building line would be basically useless to you, so instead you should be looking for something else that can exploit whatever resources that are around you. This is a really cool concept to me because it's so well implemented. It basically means the game is highly reactive, but it doesn't feel unfair. There's a lot of randomness in what you are given, but you always have ways to make it work. No matter what exactly you're doing with your settlement, your main goal is the same. Those gauges in the bottom middle of the screen represent your ability to succeed or fail, more or less. The blue gauge is, you could think of it sort of like victory points, basically. You'll earn these mostly by completing orders, but there are some other ways, we'll get into that in a minute. The red gauge is the queen's impatience with you, uh, the queen who sent you on this expedition in the first place, since she needs you to actually get this done, and uh, as you just idle throughout the game, this impatience will rise. If this gauge ever completely maxes out, you lose on the spot. Doesn't matter how good you're doing or how big your settlement is, max impatience, you're done. And orders are the main way that you manipulate these gauges. So every certain amount of time, you will gain access to several order slots. And when you click one of them, it'll show you two different orders that you could try and complete. And uh, you can pick one of them, whichever one that you think is more reasonable for you to complete at that time. That's the one you want to choose. And each order will have its own things that it expects you to do, its objective, as well as different resources and uh, other rewards that it'll give you once you actually finish it. But in addition to all this stuff, finishing any order also gives you some of that blue gauge and it reduces the queen's impatience by a segment to makes the red gauge go down. And also as a side effect of increasing the blue gauge, you will gain new blueprints as well at various thresholds. So the ability to have new blueprints and continue to expand your operations in various ways is very important. Your settlers are a very important resource as well because you need them to do pretty much everything. Just about every building will have slots that you can assign settlers to in order to do that building's work. The building will never do anything by itself. So if you've got a logging camp, you need to assign some people to actually start cutting logs. And if you've got a temple, you need to assign some people to actually give temple services and things like that. They all need population to work. But your population is actually split into several different species, which is a pretty neat idea. Uh, every species has its own advantages, its own sort of strengths, things that they like more than anyone else or things that they really need to have fulfilled uh, as like luxuries and stuff later on in order to keep them very happy. Like say for instance housing. Everyone loves housing. Uh, everyone gets upset when they don't have housing. It's pretty uh, basic. And in fact, there are some storm conditions that can actively kill people if they don't have shelter. But something like, say, jerky is something loved by lizard people. So whereas having shelter is good for everyone, having a stock full of jerky is really good for the morale of the lizard people. And the morale of a species is measured by resolve, which is that number in the green bubble in the top left of the screen. 
and you want this resolve to be as high as possible. Every species has a specific threshold where if the resolve reaches that threshold and stays there, then they'll sort of glow blue and that uh, this will gain you a passive income of those victory points. So it'll actually increase that blue gauge over time. This is really important because it makes it to where you don't have to complete every single order in order to succeed with the settlement. In uh, Dire Straits, this number can reach zero, and they'll turn red and start a countdown, and as this countdown goes, people will start to leave, so you can actually lose villagers by them having so little resolve that they don't want to stay. I don't know exactly where they think they're going to go, considering it seems like everything outside of your settlements is just like a storm barren wasteland, but I'm sure it'll be fine. So each settlement is basically about expanding outwards, finding what resources and events are available, and then capitalizing on those as much as you can by producing specific buildings and getting specific blueprints for buildings that can exploit those resources in the best way possible. So you may have tons of wheat fields, so you can make a load of ale and have really happy people because you can make a nice big tavern filled with ale and maybe even some wine. Or you may have a, uh, a settlement later that's all about woodworking and getting tons of wood, cutting it into planks, and then using those planks for various things and also creating like crates of provisions and barrels and stuff like that for a uh, higher tier production. So the whole thing is like one big lumber mill. There are also several other types of uh, more advanced buildings like uh, you'll find that several buildings can make the same things but they're not as good as each other at making the same things like you know a kiln can make coal at a very high rate and they can also make some bricks but much more slowly whereas a brickyard they can make bricks way more quickly so if you're in need of bricks you don't really want to start building kilns uh, you want to start building brickyards if you have the blueprint for it You'll also find that some of the resources in production can have multiple different sources of material. Like say the aforementioned bricks can be made from clay or stone, depending on what you have. You may not have found any clay deposits in your particular deployment, but you may have found a bunch of stone, so you can do that instead. You have a great deal of fine control over your settlers, which is pretty cool. You can place down paths whenever you want, and uh, paths will increase the speed of anyone on them, and settlers will actually specifically pathfind to use paths as much as possible automatically as soon as you start placing them, which is a nice touch. You may even have to start doing things like building extra smaller flames elsewhere, which is going to increase your fuel usage, but it's also going to increase the area that you have to build houses and temples and service buildings and things. You'll also find that the service buildings can be a bit of a drain on population, but for a good reason, because they have usually like three or four slots, so they can take quite a bit of people to man them, but they also have extra passive effects on top of what they already do if you fill all those slots, so they give you some extra benefits. You'll also sometimes be finding amber, oftentimes from uh, salvaging events out in different glades or as uh, rewards for orders. And amber is sort of like gold. It's a currency that you can spend on trading. And uh, whenever you want to, you can build a trading post in your town and every certain number of minutes, a trader will come in. And different traders have different selections of goods available and you can trade them some of your goods and trade some of their goods to you and also balance the costs out with any amber you happen to have loose and stuff in order to buy something that you might need. So these can be really important because they can give you access to uh, stuff that you can't produce. You know, you might not have the resources to produce a bunch of fabric very quickly, but a lot of buildings use fabric, so you need a bunch of it, but just can't really make it at any sort of acceptable speed right now. So if you find someone that's selling a bunch of fabric, you can stock up on it there and actually have it available. You'll also find that a lot of the merchants will have some extra passive things that you can buy from them, passive bonuses that uh, enhance different things, like, you know, give you plus one wood production, or give it, make it so where every time you produce a certain number of pigment, you also produce a certain amount of uh, incense and stuff like that. There are just various benefits that can help you depending on what you're specialized towards. There's also a massive amount of unlocks and stuff. You'll find entirely new types of species and entirely new mechanics and building types and stuff, building trees, available as you level up. 
whenever you complete a settlement, whenever you max out that blue meter, you will win. You can choose to sort of free play for a while afterwards, but you won't unlock anything else. It's just sort of for fun. But uh, once you leave that settlement that you've completed and go back to the world map, you'll get some resources depending on how well you did and what accolades you've earned and stuff like that. And you can take those resources back to the central city and spend them on upgrades. And there's a massive upgrade tree with tons of new stuff to find from things like simple stuff like making the impatience gauge grow just a little bit slower to give you some more time to complete orders to entirely new things like say unlocking the harpy species which are a whole new type of settler that you can have they're fragile but they're very good at alchemy and uh, that of course also will begin to unlock some alchemy themed stuff for you to do and then there's the overarching longer term goals of making it to the seals and actually completing all of those missions in order to, you know, use the seals and try and beat back the storm and all that. So this is the kind of game that's going to last you for a really long time because there's just such a ridiculous amount of content in it and there's so many different situations you could be put in. No two deployments feel the same. Even if you deploy twice in a row to the same biome, each one will still usually feel different because the glades will be different. The uh, resources you find and then will be different and stuff like that so you may have to specialize them to do completely different things. Overall, I think this is a really addicting, really compelling game that's super fun to just do one more settlement and just one more, one more settlement and see how it goes. And then it's like four in the morning, all of a sudden I actually had that exact experience yesterday. So yeah, this is just one of those games and I think it is an extremely well implemented version of a sort of survival city builder with roguelite elements. It also, in my opinion, has a kind of nice, endearing, stylized appearance to it that looks quite good. And also its music is very good, like better than I expected. I, I wasn't expecting it to be bad or anything. I just was expecting that maybe this was going to be like a heavily mechanics focused game. So stuff like art design and music sort of took a back seat to that. And it's definitely mechanics focused, but I don't really think that the uh, audio visual design took a back seat at all because it looks nice and it sounds great. I know this is something I'll be keeping installed on my Steam Deck for a long time to just play whenever I feel like it because this is it works really well on the deck, honestly, and the controls, of course, are perfect for a PC, but it works super well on the deck, too. But, uh, yeah, it's just one of those games that I'm going to want to return to very frequently just for one or two settlements real fast just to have some fun because there's just so much to unlock and to keep going. It's going to be like a long-term keep playing this for a while and see what you get kind of experience because there's so much new to see and uh, it's also fun that I just want to keep playing it and keep seeing what else it's going to offer to me. So uh, I'll put the link in the description below this video to the Steam Store page for Against the Storm if you guys wish to check it out yourselves. I would highly recommend it. It's a super compelling survival city builder with some really cool ideas. So thank you guys very much for watching and I'll see you next time.